The history of the forest industry in Ontario is older than the province itself. Only the fur trade reaches farther back into the settlement and growth of what was once called Upper Canada. In many ways, the story of the cutting, harvesting, and processing of wood is the story of Ontario. It's a story of human ingenuity and enterprise in the midst of a seemingly infinite forest. But the forest is not infinite. And neither were the many hundreds of lives lost by those who harvested the trees in places like this. The ranks of these fallen workers has been growing since the earliest days of the 19th century, when lumbering got underway in Ontario. But we're going to start our story 90 years ago. The Workmen's Compensation Act was less than five weeks old on that day, and a group called the Lumberman's Safety Association was granted its charter under the Act. Ninety years of organized efforts to improve the safety and health of workers in Ontario's forest industries began on the fourth day of February, 1915. It's a campaign that continues uninterrupted to this day. Some of the most legendary names in the history of Canadian lumbering were part of the pioneering efforts to reduce the heavy toll on the lives of those who harvested and processed the wood from Ontario's forests. J.R. Booth, J.A. Gillies, and Daniel McLaughlin were members of the organizing committee of the Lumberman Safety Association. The association was one of four health and safety groups founded in 1915 to serve the 21 sectors of Ontario industry that were covered by the Workmen's Compensation Act. The act was based on the idea of collective responsibility for workplace injuries. Instead of being individually liable for injuries to their employees, companies paid premiums that went into a general fund. Benefits were paid to injured workers from that fund. The premium rates the companies paid were based on the likelihood of injury in that industry. Because of the high risk of injury in forestry work and the severity of injuries when they happen, forestry firms paid the highest premium rate in the province for many years. The general situation in Ontario workplaces was grim in those early days. In the first 14 years of the workman's compensation system from 1915 through 1928, 4,737 workers lost their lives on the job in Ontario. In 1930, there were 574 work-related deaths in Ontario, including 56 fatalities in forestry. That was a 30% improvement over the 83 lives lost in Ontario's forest industries in 1929. How do those early numbers compare to recent statistics? Well, in the 14 years from 1989 through 2002, 28 forestry workers died on the job in Ontario. Almost twice as many forestry workers were killed in 1915 alone, the year the Lumberman Safety Association was formed, even though the Ontario workforce was seven times smaller than it is now. Samuel Price, the first chairman of the Workmen's Compensation Board, understood the terrible human cost of unsafe work. In a speech to a safety convention in Toronto in 1922, this is what he said about the 272,000 work-related injuries and 2,784 deaths that occurred in the first seven years of the board's existence. Compensation does not restore the life that is destroyed or the limb that is lost or crippled and no matter in what proportions the direct loss may be borne by workmen and employers, the result is economic waste, with usually everyone very much the loser. Ontario's workforce was a lot different in 1915 than it is now. Of the more than 7,000 compensation claims paid out to workers in 1915, less than 2% went to women. Among the 140 workers under the age of 21 who are compensated for being permanently injured that year, 
There were two 11-year-olds, one 13-year-old, six 14-year-olds, and 14 15-year-olds. The written accounts of two fatality compensation awards to forestry workers in 1917 paint a bleak picture of the aftermath of those incidents. A lumberman who was driving logs down a river fell in and was drowned. His widow receives $20 a month for herself and $5 for each of the two children while under 16. An unmarried man was engaged in taking logs off a skidway when one of the logs fell and crushed him to death. He left no dependents. The board paid $75 for burial expenses. The Workmen's Compensation Board approved a first budget of $4,520 for the Lumberman Safety Association. The directors held their inaugural meeting at the association's head office in Ottawa on May the 11th, 1915. The association started by hiring two inspectors at annual salaries of $1,800 to tour the province's far-flung lumber camps and sawmills. The Occupational Health and Safety Act was more than 60 years in the future. So to guide its activities, the association drew up a list of rules for the prevention of accidents that its inspectors would enforce in the lumber camps and mills. The main job of the inspectors was to ensure that employers had guarding around machinery and machine parts to protect workers from them. They also checked to see if workers had received general instruction on the avoidance of danger. Over time it became clear that machine guarding alone couldn't solve every problem. So the Lumberman Safety Association expanded its focus to include safety committees, safety meetings, the study of work processes, record keeping, and specific safety training. The association's two inspectors certainly had their work cut out for them. In 1930, timber cutting was considered amongst the five most dangerous occupations in the country. Log hoisting, sorting, and moving was number six. The men who worked in the bush were willing and able, but they weren't indestructible. Up until the 1950s, the traditional image of the lumberjack wielding his axe in the snow-covered forest was an accurate depiction of a logger. For more than a century, men were hired each autumn and sent out to lumber camps in the bush, where they spent the winter felling trees and sawing logs. It was a lot less expensive for companies to house workers in temporary camps within walking distance of the work than to build roads into the bush. In the early days, cutting gangs usually consisted of three men, an axeman and two sawyers. The axeman did the notching. Sawyers did the back cut with a two-man cross-cut saw. Then the axeman marked the log lengths and cleared away branches. The trees were sawed into log lengths of 16 feet, plus six inches to allow for damage in transit. The best cutting gangs could average 175 logs per day. Some days, as many as 250 logs were cut by a single gang. Cutting gangs were eventually reduced from three men to just two sawyers, and then to one-man crews. Cutters working alone bucked trees into eight-foot lengths. Handling and piling it was such hard work that a 1947 Ontario Royal Commission on Forestry recommended that companies abandon the eight-foot system, partly for humanitarian reasons. Once the logs were cut, they were loaded onto horse-drawn sleighs for hauling to the nearest waterway to await the spring log drive to sawmills downstream. Loading crews usually consisted of a top loader who acted as crew boss, plus two senders, two rollers, and a teamster. Using a cant hook, the roller moved the logs off the skidway to the senders, who passed them on to the top loader. To load the logs, a horse pulled on a cable that ran through a block at the top of a sled-mounted crane. At the end of the cable was a device with two hooks attached to each end of the log. Working from the load, the top loader carefully selected logs in order to build a compact load. His work involved the constant danger of injury if he slipped on the icy logs or if the pile became unbalanced. The teamster stood on top of the load while driving it, so the security of the load was very important for his safety. Because there was always the danger that the load might travel faster down hills than the horses could run, 
Road crews poured hot sand on the slopes to help slow the sled. The landing usually consisted of the banks of a river or the frozen surface of a lake, where the logs stayed until the spring breakup. River driving was the most exciting part of logging in the early days, and the most deadly. One terrible spring before the days of the Workmen's Compensation Act, 130 men lost their lives on various tributaries of the Ottawa River. The drivers were buried where they died, their graves marked by crude wooden crosses, and their boots nailed to a nearby tree. Before a river drive could begin, stream improvements such as the removal of rocks and smoothing of banks had to be done. Log chutes were constructed if certain points in the stream were impassable. Splash dams were sometimes built to allow the release of extra water if it was needed to move the logs along. These improvements were usually done the previous summer. When spring arrived and the wood was in the water, log drivers spent most of their time prodding the logs with a picaroon, a pole with a metal point and hook at the end. Sometimes the drivers worked from long, narrow boats called pointers. Sometimes they waded in the water. When large logs were being driven, the drivers actually rode the logs downstream, wearing shin-high boots with sharp quarter-inch steel caulks in the soles that helped them cling to the logs. Jam breaking was the most dangerous work in the river drive. Drivers would move to the front of the jam and try to find the logs that were causing the jam. When the kingpin log was pried loose, the jam often burst apart, leaving little time for the driver to get clear of it. Dynamite was used as a last resort to break up jams. On a river drive in Quebec in 1933, a boat carrying dynamite to a jam exploded, killing seven men and injuring six others. With the arrival of new sources of wood and new ways of getting it out of the bush, the colorful but treacherous river drive gradually lost its prominent place in the annual cycle of forestry work. Road building and the arrival of the railway opened up northern Ontario and created a logging boom in that region in the first decades of the 20th century. Most of the old growth white pine in the Ottawa Valley and central Ontario had been cut by that time and the giant sawmills that operated along the Ottawa River and Georgian Bay went out of business, one by one. Smaller, more local sawmills opened, and they often operated their own private railways to transport the wood to the mill. When all the timber had been removed from one area, the rails were pulled up and relayed in the area where new logging activity was starting. Towns sprang up around these local sawmills, and when the mills died, so did the towns. The lifespan of the town of Foss Mill, near the northwest boundary of Algonquin Park, amounted to 10 years, from its foundation in 1924 until a devastating fire in the summer of 1934 destroyed the sawmill, engine house, blacksmith shop, and power plant. By the 1920s, living conditions in the winter logging camps had become a concern for Ontario health officials. In 1926, Ontario's chief sanitary inspector demanded that first aid stations be established in every logging camp, that first aid instruction be given to every camp clerk, and that supervisors be responsible for ensuring that injured workers receive first aid. Industry response was not very optimistic. In 1927, officials with a major logging company expressed the view that any safety campaign for woodlands workers was practically impossible. Stricter rules and effective inspection were introduced and conditions improved for a while, but most of those gains vanished in the cost-cutting years of the Depression. As late as 1946, when the number of loggers living in winter camps in Ontario reached a record high of 37,000, many of the camps were still substandard. Earlier in the 1940s, when German prisoners of war became a source of forestry labor, the Provincial Board of Health forced designers to make better quarters for the POWs than was generally available for regular bush workers. Because of high Workmen's Compensation Board premiums and the expense of bringing doctors to remote locations or transporting injured workers to hospital, 
One study estimated that injuries added as much as 15% to the total cost of harvesting the wood and delivering it to the mill. Although traditional logging practices such as the winter camp persisted into the middle of the 20th century, technological change came much sooner to sawmills. Most of the mechanical innovations currently in place in sawmills were introduced two or more generations ago. Unfortunately, machine guarding didn't keep pace with the machines themselves. Men routinely worked near giant exposed flywheels and saw blades. Hearing protection was rare or non-existent. Slowly but surely, health and safety moved up the line of industrial priorities. The Workmen's Compensation Board of Ontario noted the following in its report for 1927. The Lumberman's Safety Association, whose president is Mr. John Black, is under the special charge of R.L. Sargent of Ottawa, assisted by Dr. Barnhart and other inspectors, who personally visit the different lumber camps and mills. They also hold a series of meetings each year in the different districts in which lumbering is carried on, in which the latest ideas of safety work in connection with lumbering camps and mills are urged and discussed. It is reported in one lumbering camp with 700 men engaged that the cost of compensation and medical aid was reduced from $6,000 to about $2,200 by careful attention through the attending doctor and the inspector of the safety association. The introduction of piecework payment and trucks capable of hauling for longer distances placed new demands on logging crews in the years between the two world wars. With the arrival of powerful and cheap diesel engines in the early 1930s, the number of tractors and trucks being used to haul sleighs on ice logging roads rapidly increased. Diesel bulldozers were used to create skid trails, plow snow and push logs into streams during the drive. A prototype gasoline-powered chainsaw also appeared in some logging operations, but the saw weighed as much as 75 pounds, and it took two men to operate it. Ontario Forest Industries filed more than 3,000 injury claims in 1938. That same year, the Lumbermen's Safety Association coordinated the creation of a rehabilitation unit in Ottawa for the treatment of injured forestry workers. The rehabilitation unit was run by medical superintendent Dr. W.S. Barnhart, who had been with the association since 1926 and would become its first secretary manager in 1947. Thirty-one patients were admitted in the unit's first year of operation. By 1944, the forestry workforce was estimated at 20,000, plus 7,000 prisoners of war. The Lumberman Safety Association had five inspectors stationed at Ottawa, Toronto, North Bay and Port Arthur. But the inspection role of all the health and safety associations was phased out in 1947 when inspectors handed over their enforcement powers to the Ministry of Labour and turned to education and training as their main focus. The post-war baby boom had begun and the housing construction boom was underway, creating new demands for raw lumber, veneer, plywood and other types of boards. The face of forestry was changing rapidly and so were the hazards. The invention of a lighter, cheaper chainsaw in the late 1940s revolutionized logging. Cutters reported that the work was easier and they enjoyed it more, so they stayed on the job longer and made more money. By the middle 1950s, buck saws had all but vanished from the bush. With the speed and power of chainsaws came new dangers for loggers. In 1946, only 2% of disabling logging injuries in Ontario involved machinery. Ten years later, that proportion had jumped to 15%. In an effort to reduce injuries and compensation costs, the Lumberman Safety Association encouraged Ontario loggers to wear personal protective equipment such as steel-toed boots, hard hats, earmuffs, and padded pants. Another technological innovation that had a major impact on loggers was a power skidder. To maximize the return on their investment in new skidding and forwarding equipment, logging companies gradually moved to year-round operations. 
the effects of these technological changes and the post-war economic boom rippled out to the health and safety community. The report of a Royal Commission on the Workmen's Compensation Act in 1950 was the first step towards the eventual creation of the Occupational Health and Safety Act in 1978. The Royal Commission's report concluded that the Workmen's Compensation Act didn't focus adequately on the prevention of injuries. It is infinitely more important that, where possible, an accident should be prevented than it should be permitted to occur and the victim be compensated. It is therefore appropriate that an act which provides compensation to the victims of industrial accidents should contain provisions dealing with the prevention of such accidents. In 1953, the association's inspectors became known as district representatives. They would later be called consultant trainers. 1953 was also the year the association moved its head office from Ottawa to the new Workmen's Compensation Board office in Toronto. To better reflect the fact that the industries it served were involved in the processing end of forestry, as well as cutting and harvesting, the Lumberman Safety Association changed its name to the Forest Products Accident Prevention Association in 1962. Between 1950 and 1980, 491 forestry workers lost their lives on the job in Ontario. That's an average of more than 16 fatalities per year. The annual total of work-related deaths in Ontario's forest industries fell below 10 for the first time in 1972, when eight deaths were recorded. That same year, the Forest Products Accident Prevention Association moved its head office from Toronto to North Bay in order to be closer to most of the industries it served. Logging remained one of the province's most dangerous occupations. It wasn't until the late 1980s that annual fatalities in forestry were less than 10 on a consistent basis. Over the past 90 years, 1997 is the only year in which there were no forest fatalities in Ontario. Automation and mechanization removed some of the traditional injury hazards for forestry workers and it created some new ones. Until the late 1970s, when interest in the science of ergonomics began to grow, the design of logging vehicles and other mobile machines used in forestry had rarely taken the comfort or health of the operator into account. Jostling, vibration, and high noise levels were common in the early machines, and so were back injuries for their operators. Shift work was introduced as night operations became practical creating new stresses for forestry workers. What had been missing in Ontario up until the late 1970s were clear and specific definitions of the health and safety responsibilities, rights and duties of all workplace parties. That changed in 1978 with the passage of the Occupational Health and Safety Act and regulations. That was followed in 1981 by the creation of the Council of Safety Associations that established consistent overall objectives to guide all of Ontario's health and safety associations. By the 1980s, the Forest Products Accident Prevention Association had district representatives stationed in eight districts across the province. The growth of the association reflected the increased mobility and mechanization of the industry. As an experiment in going beyond shared objectives to actually combining operations, the Forest Products Accident Prevention Association was merged with the Ontario Pulp and Paper Makers Association and the Mine Accident Prevention Association to form the Ontario Natural Resources Safety Association in 1993. The experiment ended five years later in 1998 when the three groups were separated and the Ontario Forestry Safe Workplace Association came into being. The content and delivery methods of the association's training and information services had to respond to the new technology being used in forestry. 
Today, the association makes use of the latest multimedia technology to expand the reach and flexibility of the information, training, and consultation services we deliver to forestry firms. In recent years, our mandate has expanded to include the silviculture sector so that the health and safety material we create and distribute now covers the entire cycle of forestry activities, from cutting, harvesting, and processing the resources to planting and sustaining them. We value the close access we have to the experience and expertise of our industry partners. Two-thirds of the members of our board of directors are forestry managers and workers. Our own senior management and most of our consultant trainers got their start in the industry. We work closely with volunteer safety committees of industrial representatives in each district and several industry advisory committees are actively involved in the planning and development of the health and safety products and services we offer. We also continue to build our ongoing partnerships with the Ontario Ministry of Labour, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, and the other health and safety associations. Our shared goal is to improve the coordination of health and safety services in all Ontario workplaces. Technological advances have transformed the industries we serve and the way we've served them over the past 90 years. Yet two of the main health and safety values that guide our current activities, the importance of well-trained supervisors and fully informed new and young workers, were identified by the earliest practitioners of health and safety in Ontario. Today, our association uses the vast and powerful capabilities of the internet and the latest interactive computer-based training methods to drive our health and safety message. But the fundamental message is as simple as ever. No job is worth a human life. Statistics show that forestry workplaces are much safer today than they were 90 years ago. We like to think that in our 90 years of continuous service to the industry, we have had a hand in helping to reduce the terrible human cost of forestry work. But it's the will of the people working in the industry, the owners, managers, supervisors and workers, to improve the health and safety of their day-to-day -day work that has made the biggest difference of all. Our celebration of 90 years of health and safety services to forestry firms is also a celebration of what our industry partners have accomplished over the decades. The work is far from over. Lives are still being lost and serious injuries are still occurring. We can't afford to be complacent. But we can afford to recognize the great strides that have been made over the past 90 years. The lost time injury total at forestry firms has dropped 40% in just four years. Anyone who thinks that the goal of completely eliminating lost time injuries and illnesses from forestry workplaces is unrealistic needs to know that 87% of the firms in the WSIB forestry groups did not experience a lost time injury in 2003. We at the Ontario Forestry Safe Workplace Association look forward to the day when fatal injuries on the job are a distant memory and lost time injuries of any kind are a rarity. No one should have to pay such a high price for making a living. The worst days are behind us, but that's not good enough. To honor the memory of the hundreds of forestry workers who paid the ultimate price, we need to do everything in our power to make sure that the best days are still ahead.